Well, hey there, everyone. Sorry, I'm a couple minutes late for the party. Hey, Tom. How's everybody doing today? Good. We're wonderful. There he is, Deborah. He saved you. <laughs> Deborah, I believe it's my day, right? It is. I was just here to get everybody warmed up for you. We're ready. Okay, good. You're the opening <laughs> act today. I'll reciprocate <laughs> next time. <laughs> Well, welcome to Broker Chat, everyone. Um, I am Tom Fulkerson, your qualifying broker, along with Deborah Blue, our managing broker in uh, Midtown. Um, well, and welcome to Broker Chat. So these sessions are always um, about whatever it is you want to talk about. I'm going to speak about some issues today that um, I entitled, Keeping You Out of Real Estate Jail. How does that sound? Feel free to interrupt, uh, ask questions, um, participate. It's more fun when everybody participates. So I made a few notes the other day at the request of a team leader who wanted me to talk um, about some topics that uh, everybody should be very cognizant of because participating in some of these issues might uh, affect your real estate license and we don't want that to happen. So the one thing that Deborah and I try to bring to the table on these uh, calls are issues that we actually deal with on a daily basis so that to make you aware of any kind of trend we're seeing in the market um, and to help you stay out of trouble and to help you better serve uh, your clientele. So that being said, um, I'm going to go over some things that I feel like are critical for you as a real estate professional to make sure that you deliver um, to your clients. And the first thing is uh, that could really get you in trouble is basically it's just writing a bad contract. Uh, not filling in the blanks. Um, if you're writing special stipulations and you're not putting consequences on those special stipulations, that also causes issues. We get phone calls about that all of the time um, because the agent failed to say, well, what happens if this special stipulation isn't met? And I'll give you a really good example of what I deal with more than anything is um, when a seller who has agreed to uh, make certain repairs in the property and they agree to make these repairs and provide receipts five days prior to closing. Um, and I get a lot of phone calls as I'm sure Deborah does that, um, guess what, we went to do our walkthrough and the repairs have not been made or have not been completed. Um, and generally there's no, if I look at that contract, there's no consequences <clears throat> to that seller if they don't get these things done. Well, first and foremost, they're in breach of contract by not uh, <clears throat> doing what they agreed to do but without consequences, it could just be a closing that blows up in your face uh, or a very unhappy buyer because we didn't follow up and make sure these things were taken care of. So as I've spoken to you guys about this in the past regarding temporary occupancy, you've got to put things in there that um, hurt. For example, in the temporary occupancy agreement, if the holdover rate, if the seller doesn't get out of the property is $100 a day, that's really not very significant. Because at the end of the day, if that seller needs a couple of more days to move for whatever reason, $200 really isn't going to hurt them, but it sure is going to hurt your buyer. So it's things like that that we need to put some teeth into. I would definitely say a holdover rate for me, if I were writing that contract, would be a minimum of $500 a day. So 
that that is the same thing about writing a contract and adding special stipulations that don't have a consequence. So please make sure you do that. So writing bad contracts uh, is an issue that could get you into trouble. Um, missing timelines in contracts, that's a big one. That can definitely get you in trouble, particularly around earnest money and the delivery of earnest money, which is also one of the top seven items that I noted that could get you in real estate jail is handling, mishandling other people's money or writing a contract with zero due diligence and stating that the earnest money would be delivered three days from binding agreement. And I can't tell you how many contracts and buyers have decided at the last minute for whatever reason that they're gonna terminate and then they haven't submitted the earnest money. That's a big issue for the broker, the holder of the funds, and it's a big issue for you as an agent in terms of liability. So please make sure that you're following up and making sure that you're the number one thing that I would say you need to do when you get that contract bound is make sure and follow up and make sure that earnest money's been delivered and deposited in a timely manner per the contract. So I get a lot of questions, Deborah. I'm sure you get these questions too regarding earnest money and what happens if the buyer doesn't deliver the funds. Well, the contract says that we've got to notify them in writing. And I always suggest using the notice form, it's a GAR form, that the earnest money was due on this, on this date and it hasn't been delivered. So the seller can't automatically terminate the contract. They have to provide notice and that buyer has three banking days in which to make good on that earnest money. And if they haven't done that within the three banking days, then on the fourth day through the seventh day, the seller can terminate the contract by way of unilateral termination. And if they wait past seven days, then they've really accepted that contract with no earnest money. So that's the process on that. And I want to make sure that everybody on this call is clear about that. So are there any questions or discussions about that? I had an incident in one of the offices where there was a $25,000 earnest money that was supposed to be delivered and the buyer terminated, but guess what? There was another buyer on the contract and they didn't terminate. They didn't sign that termination until after the due diligence period was over. So that turned into a big, big issue for the brokerage um, and we got it resolved because as the holder of the funds, once we knew that we didn't have those uh, funds, we notified the other broker that the funds were never tendered. And after three banking days, the buyer didn't uh, tender the funds. But at that point, the contract had been terminated. So we'll see where we are with that. I still think at some point there's going to be some litigation over that. Um, I, I want to jump in and just comment on this particular thing because it's just happened in our office. Um, I have power washing going on outside my door, so that's why my, my thing muted so you guys don't hear that. But um, one of the things that would solve a little bit of what Tom just said is pay attention to that first page of your contract when they're putting due diligence and earnest money. For some reason, we've gotten into this habit of, you know, X amount of days due diligence, but earnest money is delivered three days later, five days later. Um, when I started in the business, you guys, we got earnest money before butt hit leather. Okay, you know, yeah. I, I invited my buyer to show up with a full belly and their checkbook. And I collected that, whether we found a house or not. So then my broker was already holding that earnest money. And for some reason, we're giving two, three, four days without even asking the buyer, uh, can you wire those funds now? And what happens? That goes into 
uh, holding with our broker. And then if you don't buy anything, we send it back to you. Or if they write a check, we give it back to you. Because remember, if they are giving you a check, that's being held. It's not being deposited. Wiring is different. But at the end of the day, if you pay attention to those dates, what Tom just talked about probably won't even come up because you've got the money. And people are, are doing a free look with no skin in the game. And then your seller is going to be upset. Yeah, I, I like that, Deborah. I mean, that's where I come from, too. We always collected money. And in fact, I think I told you guys, of course, this was back in the dark ages before wiring was going on. But I always sent a copy of the earnest money check with the offer. Also, uh, the other thing I said, so there wasn't any confusion and I knew I was going to get paid uh, the uh, commission was the instructions to closing attorney. I sent that and the earnest money with my offer to that uh, listing agent. And that's really good practice, guys, especially I've got another um, uh, number six on my list was commission issues. And um, today, more than ever, we're having a lot of commission issues where the listing agent is take, uh, offering the buyer's agent two, two and a half um, percent commission. And um, I have very strong feelings that if you are not, if you're meeting with a seller and you don't have your value proposition to negotiate that 6% commission, you should not uh, take that out of the uh, <clears throat> buyer's broker's end. You should eat that on your end because if you have a good value pr proposition and a good marketing plan, your 6% shouldn't be an issue. But please do not discount that commission to your buyer's agent because that buyer's agent, depending on the price point, may have written 15 offers for that buyer in this market. So let's be respectful of our co-op agents and let's make sure that Keller Williams um, does the right thing and always offers a 3% selling commission to the uh, selling agent. Um, on that same note, we're seeing a lot of um, private remarks where uh, the agent is saying, if you work for a discount broker and they name the brokerages and your commission will be uh, 1% or 1.5%. And guess what, guys? I ran that by legal counsel on Friday and that's a big no-no because as I suspected, that could be... Uh, considered if we got investigated as price fixing, um, a uh, violation of the Sherman Antitrust Act, all types of things. So his, his advice is he's steering brokers away from using that language in um, our listings. And I uh, am advising you to do the same. It also, in a roundabout way, could also lead to perhaps a fair housing issue if that buyer uh, wanted to uh, go the, in that direction. Any questions about that? Tom, I'm sorry, could you repeat the beginning of the statement that you said to stay away from or avoid? I'm sorry. A lot of listing agents are putting in their private remarks on their listings that if you work for a discount broker and they name the brokers um, like Redfin, Open Door, uh, so on and so forth, uh, that your commission will be 1% or 1.5%. Uh -huh. And our legal counsel has advised us against doing that on our listings. Okay. Thank you. It's You're also, welcome. It, it's also in the code of ethics and standard of practice that we're not supposed to do that, but it is considered price fixing. Yeah. Haven't run across one yet, but okay. <laughs> Is there a way to, to get it? This is hard. Is there a way to kind of not saying it should be done, but uh, would variable rate commission be a way to wiggle around that too? Because I know why they're doing it, but will variable rate commission be a way to allow them to do that? Yes. Okay. What is a variable rate commission? Tom? 
<laughs> I know it, but Variable I don't know if I can rate explain commission it. means that there's a commission scale and it has to be disclosed on the uh, FMLS sheet. It also has to be disclosed with your seller on your listing agreement. But I would be very careful about that, guys, because if you open up Pandora's box, there's going to be some issues. And that seller, if they find out that that's a, a, an option, they may not want to pay you your full commission. Let's just all do the right thing. Let's pay the selling broker their 3%. That's what they're entitled to. All right, so we've gone through missing time. Hey, hey, oh, I got, yeah. I got one one quick question. So, with that being said, if if it's where you are doing the same, if it's a split 50-50, whatnot, -50, that's two point five percent to the seller, two point five percent on the listing side. Would that be okay? If you're doing fair, like okay, if you're not getting your full, I'm not getting mine either. My. I, I, my point of view is that if you cannot negotiate a 6% commission because of whatever reason, you should take two and you should offer that uh, selling broker three. Okay. okay. That's my position. Okay. Okay. Uh, so I've gone through, let's see, missing timelines, earnest money. We've talked about commission issues. We've talked about writing bad contracts. Let's talk about a contract with a missing legal description. I see that quite often. And the bottom line is if you don't put a legal description or attach a legal description to your contract, it is a voidable contract. Even if you put the deed, if you do the deed and the plat, if you check that one, it's still avoidable. You still have to do check A and put the legal description? No. Oh, okay. If, if you fill out any four of those options, you're fine. Okay. But I see a lot of contracts more than I would like with nothing checked. That's a void contract. And if you're dealing with a smart consumer, you may get all the way to the closing table and they're like, well, we don't have a contract because there was no legal description on there. And quite frankly, if it goes to court, the judge is gonna say the same thing. I've had it happen, not me personally, but I've had to be a part of that discussion. <clears throat> so legal descriptions. Um, the next thing on my list is lead-based paint exhibits and timing. So we all know that this is a crazy market and things are moving at a very, very fast pace. However, if you are a listing agent, it is of utmost urgency when you have that listing agreement signed that if that property was built prior to 1978, that you have that lead-based paint exhibit uh, filled out and signed by the seller and have it uploaded into your listing in FMLS because the uh, law says that prior to going under a binding contract, that that has to be reviewed and signed. Is everyone aware of that? So this is not something that can happen during the due diligence period. It needs to happen before the contract goes binding. And technically they're supposed to be looking at that and signing it before the offer is ever made. And can so, I add something, Tom? Go ahead. Uh, this is Barbara. And hey, Barbara. And Tom, I wanted to add to that. It's also in our contract now that that lead-based paint disclosure needs to be filled out um, before you enter it into the listing because it's part of the associated documents now. Uh, so that needs to be filled out while you're getting that listing agreement signed so that it is available immediately when you list it. And it is a part of the contract now. I'm, I'm sorry. It's a part of the exclusive seller listing ag agreement. Yeah. 
but you'd be surprised how many people are not doing that. And uh, if we get Nick, can I ask a question? Sure. Yeah, I, I, I'm just at I'm asking because in the um, on page seven, lead based paint is one of the ones that you can check or not check. So my question is, does it have to be part of the contract or is it optional if 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 applicable? It has to be part of the contract if the property was built prior to 1978. You're right, because at the very top of that lead-based paint disclosure, there is an OCGA, which is Georgia license law, that yeah. says that that lead-based paint disclosure, license law says we have to complete that. Yeah, so the importance of that, guys, is that if the EPA comes in and uh, audits us, which they have been known to do, the fines are in excess of $10,000 for every um, failure to have it done correctly. It's a lot of money, right? A good practice, you guys, if you're listing agents, when you're at that listing appointment and you are sending those documents through Remind or Command where they're filling them out, we do have the icon under FMLS and Georgia MLS to upload those documents and then put a little courtesy note in the private remarks that uh, all the documents you need to give us an offer have been uploaded for your convenience. I do that on every listing. So if you do that, then when that agent is able to download your documents, that's prior to making an offer. They can look over the seller's disclosure. They can look over the lead paint before even sending you over an offer. Yeah. <clears throat> Thank you, Deborah. All right. So I've gone over, let's see, one, two, three, four, five, six items. I've got one more I'd like to talk about. And then we're going to open the floor up to. Uh, conversation, and that is brokerage agreements. Okay, and the reason I wrote brokerage agreements uh, is because we're either some people are not adhering to that brokerage agreement. They may be putting a coming soon sign up for months on end uh, and not putting the marketing date on the agreement or you're working with a buyer and you're writing a contract with them without a buyer brokerage agreement. And that's against the law. It's a state law, guys. It's not a real estate law. It's a state law before entering into any type of brokerage agreement with either a seller or a buyer, we must have a signed agreement. So I wanna talk a little bit about that and see if anybody has any questions about uh, getting these brokerage agreements signed properly and adhering to that brokerage agreement. Y'all are all. I don't have any questions, but I, I kind of like. I use the fact. Hey, a lot, I use. I use the fact that it is a state law to get people to sign. You know, see, it says here in this form as a state law, you must sign this for me to represent you as a client. Right. So that. Eliminates any him and hard, so yeah. to speak. Hey, uh, Tom, it's Sherry Crow. Good morning. Hey, how are you? Good. I'm great. I, I do have actually a question about the buyer brokerage agreement. Um, I often will meet with buyers, but will not sign the brokerage agreement on a first meeting. Um, and my typically my practice might be to to have them sign it when prior prior to when we're going to make an offer on a home is that bad practice like if i'm showing them houses without a brokerage agreement is that really bad that's really bad <laughs> ah so okay so i sort of had it you, in my you, head you that, are not allowed what? to dispense any type of real estate advice to a seller or a buyer without an agreement in place all right so prior to opening a door. I need to get that thing signed. Yeah. Prior to having a discussion about uh, the market or anything, honestly, um, you need to have that agreement signed. Huh? Wow. Okay. 
All right, I've been doing that wrong. <laughs> for that card. Hello. What? Go ahead. Yeah, this is Christine. Hi, um, Christine. Hi. So my question is, I had that before. Um, how would you overcome that objection if you say, well, I cannot give you really any real estate advice without the sign by a brokerage agreement. And then the prospect would say, well, agent Y and C, they showed me five homes and without having me sign that. What do you tell them? You tell them that you your license is more important to you than apparently than that agent's license is to them. Okay. And that you um, uh, follow your broker's advice and staying within the confines of the law. And that's what's a requirement. It says it right on top of the form. It's real easy to show them that uh, mm -hmm. when you're having a consultation with someone. Mm -hmm. And that makes me look as a real professional on top of makes you look like the real professional. Okay. And Thank I would you. play that up because you are the professional. Mm -hmm. Because if someone's out showing real estate without a brokerage agreement, they're not being professional. Yep. Okay, yeah, that's a good point. Yeah, that's a good script. Thank you. You're welcome. Constance, do you have your hand up? Yes. So I always cover agency when I'm doing a buyer's um, consultation or even listing um, consultation. And how do I explain the difference between being, I always say, you know, you can either be my customer or my client. If I can't do what anything for them unless they're under agency with me. Correct. I mean, if they're a customer, you can only dispense, uh, minister, you can only do ministerial acts. You can't advise. And I would use, the, you know, something like, well, you know, I, I would like for my years of experience to be able to consult with you and advise you on a transaction that's probably one of the larger transactions monetarily that you'll ever make. So that as a customer, that would only include, you just stated that we cannot write contracts for them unless they're in agency. You, could, you can write a contract for them, but you can't advise them. You'll, you could just simply say, uh, tell me how you want me to fill in these blanks. You can't okay. advise them. Okay. Does that make sense? Yes, it does. Okay, great. Thank you. You're welcome. Let me add a little bit to that for because people were asking about how to present. Um, when you take that first phone call, we learned in pre-license to find out a little bit about the person on the other end of the phone, whether they're listing. If let's say it's a seller, should we not be asking, are you listed already? Um, because you may be crossing a listing agreement because sometimes a seller will start to shop around for a new person and you just go right into your, your spiel and you don't even know that they're already listed, okay? So the first, com the first contact with the person is when you open up the conversation about agency. So you might say something like, hi, this is Deborah with Keller Williams Realty Atlanta Midtown. I'm returning your call. Great. I'd like to work with you. I want to see this home. Great. Are you represented by anyone? Have you signed a, an agreement? Because sometimes th some of the things Tom and I go through, it's another brokerage calling me about, hey, so-and-so, I took that person out and, and so on and so forth. It starts with that first conversation or that first meeting. Um, I think the young lady who was just speaking about her um, presentation, or I call it CETO, come into the meeting, come into the meet, come into the office. You are sitting down with that person to say, by law, here's the script, by law, I have to explain agency to you so that you can decide how you would like me to represent you. You see how I open that up? And then I explain the agency. Or if you have a hard time explaining agency, if you look in GAR, GAR forms under CB, 
I don't know which number it is, the ABCs of agency, I think it might be CBO one, the first one, um, it says the ABCs of agency, which describes all of the agencies, you can hand that to them as, as well. That's, that's, and that's um, the smoking gun to say, I explained agency. So you have two options, learn it and explain it, or hand that to them as part of your package when, you, when you're talking about a buyer or a seller. I hope that helps. Yeah, that's great, Deborah. And I'll go even one step further. A lot of agents, a lot of buyers agents have their clients initial that ABCs of agency and make that part of their whole contract package, so to speak, for their, um, you know, buyer broker agreement. Okay, guys, guess what? I want to talk about one more thing that I am dealing with um, a lot now. And that is, I'm getting calls from Miss Vivian Chang at the Real Estate Commission because they are about two years behind in complaints on advertising. Advertising, websites, signage, so on and so forth. So, the reason I bring this up is it's a really good time to uh, take a look at your marketing material because on one particular website, I got a call Friday. We thought we had it fixed and she went back and took a look at it and said, no, there's seven pages. So on every page of that website, we had it to add the uh, broker's name and phone number. And then she brought up the size of the broker's name and phone number. And as you know, anytime we're advertising real property, the broker's name and phone number must be as large or larger than your name and phone number. So my guess is most of you all are probably not in compliance. So I would go back and take a look at all of that ASAP so that um, I don't get a call about your marketing because this is a big topic now and they seem to be hitting Keller Williams pretty hard. And that's because we are all about the agent and their business and not so much about Keller Williams. So we encourage agents to market themselves and their business, but we still have to be in compliance with uh, Georgia law. So please take a look at that because I've been dealing, if I get one more phone call, my head's gonna pop off. So, <laughs> um, Please do yourself and me a favor and go back and take a look at all of your uh, marketing. Uh, you may not be aware of this, but you should be aware of this, that anything that you're advertising must be approved by your broker before you're able to do it. That is signage, postcards, websites, the whole kit and caboodle. Tom, I will tell you, my eight years of being the broker in Midtown, I can count on one hand how many things have ever crossed my desk to look at and approve. That tells yeah. me that we have a lot of things out there that are probably not um, in compliance. I get some uh, requests for business cards and signage, but beyond that, sometimes uh, occasionally an agent will um, have me take a look at their website before they have it published, but probably 99% of the agents do not do that. And the real estate commission is out there looking, guys. I had an agent at a former brokerage that I was the broker for who had just redone their whole marketing um, look, cards, signs, everything. And they had to redo every single thing to the tune of about $1,800. Kat Pryor, I see your hand up, but I don't see your lovely face. 
Good morning. Afternoon, I should say. Good morning. Um, so I have a quick question about the seller property disclosure. Um, ordinarily, we are to you know, upload that along with the other documents. But when I don't have a seller that does a, a property disclosure, um, there is no form that says no property disclosure. So what, what are we to do with that? Well, <clears throat> that is a, uh, a predicament because we're supposed to provide a disclosure. However, there's so many um, homes that are sold by heirs or um, by power of attorney because they are deceased and they don't know anything about the property. So mm -hmm. my uh, standard answer is just have them fill out and just check um, I have no information about any of this, and that's your disclosure. Does that make sense? So what, what are they filling out exactly? The actual seller property disclosure? Seller property disclosure, but they're just saying we don't know anything about any of it, So, but we're presenting it because we're required to, but we're not really disclosing anything. <laughs> but at least you have a disclosure. Deborah, can you think of any other... Um, proper way to deal with that? Yes, if uh, Kat, if you go to, have you ever looked at the special steps table of uh, uh, content or the index? Have you ever seen that before? Special steps, no. Okay, so I'm not sure how it shows up in command, Tom, so you might have to help with this. Um, when I teach contracts, I give everyone a copy of the index for the GAR forms and also the index for the special steps, special steps that have already been written for us by our uh, wonderful contract committee. There is a special step. I wanna say it's SS, which means special steps 322. And it says no disclosure will be provided. That is what you would put in your, I would, I would advise you to put it in your listing special steps, as well as your offer or contracts once you receive one. But they did, they did accommodate us for those sellers that don't fill it out. And Tom is correct. That happens with relocation. That happens with REOs. That happens with investors. That happens with anyone, heirs. That happens with anyone who didn't live in the property. So they don't really know what to say. Both are correct. You can provide the disclosure and they can write across, don't know anything to fill out or use the special step. I think it's 322 if you look it up. Does anybody on the call know? I don't know the numbers by heart, but I know where it is. Could you yeah, tell me what Kat, all of those All of those special stipulations are detailed. Uh, they should be detailed. What uh, electronic service do you use? Uh, I use, um, and I can't stand it. Um, Well, well it doesn't need, matter whether docu it's not loop, DocuSign, DocuSign. or mm -hmm. um, Remind, they should have all of those forms in there. Uh, and usually the special steps are at the very beginning. And when you're, you know, looking at for a particular document, you just write special steps in there and they should auto populate. Horace, did you have a comment? Yeah, if we are just advertising ourselves, we don't have to have the broker information, right? If we're just saying, hey, I'm a realtor over here, not advertising the property, we don't, we can just have our information, correct? That's correct. Okay, thanks. But I will add a caveat to that, Horace. You work for the largest real estate company in Atlanta. Why wouldn't you want to let people know that you work for Keller Williams? You don't have to answer. I'm just saying. Oh, it's a question that came up. I just want to make sure I was advising correctly. Yeah. <laughs> so we could find the special steps in, in the... Um, in the GAR form index. Platform index. Got it. Thank you. You're welcome. Guys, that's all I have to speak to you about today. Does anybody else have anything that they want to bring up? 
I do have one more question and forgive me if you covered this, uh, Tom. You talked about putting teeth into special stipulations, all right? And you talked about repairs not being done. Uh, you get to the walkthrough and you've got, you then, you, then you've got a disaster on your hands, right? So for repairs, what would you say to put in the, what, what, what could the teeth be? What could the, you know, consequence be that you could put into the contract? I would say something like this. I'm just throwing this out there. Um, uh, generally, what it says is that a seller will have all repairs that are agreed to completed with receipts provided to the buyer five days before closing. And then that's the end of it. I would probably go on to say that um, if, if the seller has not completed repairs and provided receipts five days before closing, seller will then agree to pay another thousand dollars towards buyer's closing costs or something like that. A penalty. Mm -hmm. Good. Thank you. All right. Good enough. Appreciate it. Sure. Okay, guys, anybody else have anything they'd like to speak about this morning? I hope this has been helpful. Um, I try not to be too preachy on these calls, but sometimes it's important to hear that from your broker. Um, I hope that you will join us again on the 25th, Monday the 25th at noon. Uh, and my cohort in crime, Ms. Deborah Blue, will be leading that discussion. And um, I will be on that call to support her. Everybody have a great Monday. And oh, by the way, for those of you on the call, I am leaving Thursday for vacation. I will be out of the office returning on Monday the 25th. Please contact in Midtown. Deborah uh, will be here. She's also offered to assist with the Buckhead office. If anybody here is on Buckhead, Decatur will be Sean and uh, Brian Crawford. And the other market centers should uh, contact your front desk or team leader uh, for support in whatever it is. And they'll either help you or point you in the direction of somebody who will. Hey, Tom, good for you for vacation. I wanna add one more thing and get your take on it. Uh, all of us have um, alliance partners in our office, and we're having a terrible time in our market center with the affiliate business disclosure. Can you just take a few minutes to give your position on that? Yes. Uh, there was a, uh, a lawsuit not too many years ago because... Um, this goes beyond affiliated... Uh, business disclosure, but it's a disclosure that must be filled out if we have a partner in our office that is either paying rent or that we get some valuable service from. You must disclose that on the affiliated business disclosure, okay? Failure to do so could lead to a lawsuit. Many years ago, there was a client, I think somewhere up in Gwinnett County, who sued um, FMLS because it wasn't disclosed to him that they provide rebates to brokers. And that suit wound up not going anywhere, I think, after many, many years. But the same thing could happen to you if you don't disclose that, for example, Indicator, Shelter Mortgage, and the Friar Law Firm are our affiliated business partners. And we have to disclose that. So please make sure that those are included with every contract. There's a space for it when you list um, when you list your property, and please make sure those are signed so that we can prevent any type of legal action down the road if somebody gets upset about something because they're out there. Does that answer your question, Deborah? Yes, um, I'm getting a lot of um, uh, 
requests as to uh, I need to get paid. I didn't turn in the affiliate business disclosure and our compliance broker won't approve my file. I mean, again, that's another thing that can be filled out yeah. during the listing and just upload yeah. that so the buyer and, uh, uh, and the seller can fill that out. And I know that other companies have their own and sometimes they don't want to sign ours. It is the policy in the Midtown office as long as the uh, customer or client that we represent signs it, we're okay if the other doesn't because they have their own. Right. So, um, so that's we we gave a little leeway. It used to be both had to sign. We've given you a little bit of leeway. So now it's pushed back on not getting it signed at all. And I and as Tom just said, that's not going to happen. So please make sure everyone is doing that. Please. All right. Anything else before we adjourn? All right, we'll see you on the 25th. Everybody have a great day and a great rest of the week.